But Kimba Smith is going to enlighten us today about her story. She grew up in Richmond, Virginia. She graduated from high school and she attended the prestigious Hampton University. Unfortunately, during Kimba's time at Hampton, she got connected to the wrong crowd and wound up in the criminal justice system. In 1994, she was sentenced to 24.5 years in prison, and she served 6.5 years in federal prison. Thankfully, in 2000, she was granted executive clemency by President Clinton, and this was as a result of drug war policies. And this travesty happened to Kimba, even though she never dealt drugs herself or used drugs. And if this could happen to Kimba, the reality is that it could happen to anyone. And her story was recognized across the nation as being an example of what can happen with our failed war on drugs if we do not stop the things that are going on. In your program, you will see information about Kimba Smith's book called Poster Child. Please join me in welcoming Kimba Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. I am blessed um, to be standing before you. Um, it was intended for me to still be in federal prison today until the year 2016. That's something that I don't take lightly. You all may hear the year 2016 and think, oh, well, that's just next year. But I was actually, I turned myself in in 1994 and um, was sentenced in 1994. So I was supposed to be in prison from 1994 to 2016. Thankfully, President Clinton granted me executive clemency in December 2000. Um, President Obama has been doing well. I'm glad that he is increasing his numbers. Um, I'm grateful for the transformation and how he's introducing that there needs to be a change. But like Nakima said, there's so much more that needs to be done. And I know, Reese, well, not recently, it's been some months where he commuted 46 uh, people's sentences, and when I looked at the list, I was very disappointed to only see five women, mm -hmm. especially when I still have friends who are in federal prison serving life sentences and have already served over 23 years in federal prison. I like to show a video clip of when I was incarcerated in Danbury, Connecticut, in women's federal prison there. It's not too many people, too many grown women that would want to come out of that situation and continuously tell this story over and over. It's been almost 15 years that I've been out of federal prison. But I've been doing it, number one, because I don't believe each and every young person has to make each and every mistake there is to make in life that they can learn from hearing another person's story. Then number two, I'm grateful that I became empowered by working with some of the people that supported me during my incarceration and I put on an advocacy hat and I've been on the hill speaking about criminal justice policies, drug sentencing, crack versus powder cocaine, felony disenfranchisement, reentry issues. And so it's just been very important for me to continue to be that voice, even though when I came out of prison, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund they're the ones that represented me pro bono eventually after my parents had exhausted all of their savings, retirement. Um, they advised me to sit down and not publicly speak out about my situation because the federal government was not happy that I had been released from federal prison. But I tell people, be careful what you pray for. Because I can remember when I was seven months pregnant in my jail cell, I prayed and I asked God to allow me to be a voice. And when those prison doors open, and when I proceed, I don't know why I'm being so emotional right now. Um, but when those prison doors opened, and I got my first speaking invitation from the mayor of the city of Richmond for Martin Luther King Day celebration, where there were over 3,500 people there, and I was standing before the governor and several elected officials, I had no choice but to open my mouth, even though I was scared to death fresh out of prison. But like I said, I left so many Kimba Smiths behind in federal prison that deserved the same opportunity. So I said that I was going to continue to be a voice for them. And I think, like Nakima mentioned, the power of the pen, the power of organizing. There were so many individual <coughs> people that signed petitions, wrote letters, organizations, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Deltas, the Links. Now, 
let's back up. Any of you all that are familiar with those organizations, a drug case, that hadn't been going on where the national president of the Delta and the Lynx would speak about drug policy reform and black women being the fastest growing population within prison. And so I thank God that he has used me in this ordeal, but understand initially coming out of prison, I think I was just so grateful for what the president had done and I wanted to speak out to prevent other young people from going down the same path. But since my transformation and being involved with so many organizations such as the ACLU, the Sentencing Project, um, different mentors. Recently I had the opportunity to speak at the Department of Justice Office Against Violence Against Women where their whole <coughs> office sat and listened to various issues amongst experts across the country. And my exposure with my transformation, judgment <laughs> has always been an issue with particular cases like mine. Mm -hmm. Well, you got involved with the drug dealer, you must have known what he was doing. And some people have the perception or opinion that I should have received the 24 and a half years and why should the president have freed me? But when you look at the totality, and I'm so grateful for the transformation with this country and the president in this issue of criminal justice where it's a bipartisan effort, should I have even gone to prison is the question. And so I admit, I admit fault. I'm not one that said that there was nothing that I did wrong other than, you know, I do like most girls. When I went to college, I met this guy, got enamored, and the relationship became abusive. So being at this conference a few months ago made me realize, you know, I came home focused on this criminal justice issue, but when you look at this issue of violence against women, and knowingly my judge was sleeping during my sentencing hearing when there were two expert witnesses testifying to the domestic violence that I endured, those issues should be taken into consideration. They're alternatives to incarceration. So, because of that incarceration, I gave birth to my son while I was incarcerated. I, the judge said, the prosecutor said, first let me back up, the prosecutor said that if I turned myself in, he would give me a bond so that I could give birth to my son. He reneged on that promise. Then he also said that, oh, I'm getting a three-minute time mark in the back. Oh, gosh. Let me hurry up. Um, Take your time. Okay. Um, and then the second promise he made was that if I pled um, guilty that I would only receive 24 months and he reneged on that promise as well. So here I am, first time non-violent drug offender giving birth to my son in a local hospital in Suffolk, Virginia. And after I gave birth to him, five minutes afterwards, the U.S. Marshals came into my room directing these orders saying that my leg had to be handcuffed and shackled to the bed at all times, that I had to have two correctional officers guarding me, that my parents had to leave the room. Had that not, had, there was a woman who was head of the hospital, my dad had, being the dad that he was, went to the hospital in advance to let them know that I was coming so they wouldn't see this little black girl in handcuffs and braids thinking that they could just treat me any old kind of way, that I had a family that cared about me. And so by him doing that, the woman who was head of the hospital was there when the U.S. Marshals were given these orders, and most people wouldn't speak up to the U.S. Marshals. I thank God for her spirit because she told the Marshals it was her hospital, she was going to do what she wanted to do. And Stay in the room next door. Had that not happened, my son would have automatically gone into the social service system because there wouldn't have been anybody there to physically take custody of him. And so in mentioning my son and having a five-year-old daughter, when she turned five, I had this revelation. That this is all of what I missed in raising my son. And my daughter wasn't even six and a half yet. So this is my transformation and the fact that I was robbed of that. And then 
coming home, my son is doing well. He's on a full scholarship at Washington Lee University. He studied his freshman year at Oxford University in England, sophomore year in Nice, France, and junior year in Madrid, Spain. Issues that we've had to work through as a family. When you look at these policies, and criminal justice. There needs to be a real transformation. So I thank God that after eight years, almost eight years, President Obama has made this statement. He's opened the door. But there is so much more that needs to be done. And so I've done work around um, the drug policies and laws, but also one of my biggest issues when I came home from federal prison was in this 2008 election, I couldn't vote. Even though I was listed as a nonviolent offender, drug offender, there's so much I want to mention. I promise I'm going to sit down. Um, thank you. Um, you all heard the 500 grams of powder cocaine that the federal government held me accountable for, but it was actually 255 keys of crack cocaine, even though the prosecutor said, I never handled, used, or sold any of the drugs that are involved. There were some things that I did, but yet what I did did not warrant the 24 and a half year sentence or, in my opinion now, with my transformation, any prison time at all. But with coming home and having a drug conviction, you would think that was a nonviolent offense. The federal government listed it as a nonviolent offense. But with the Virginia State Legislature, if you have a drug case, that's automatically counted as a violent offense during this period when I was trying to get my rights restored. And so I couldn't vote. I helped with the get out the vote effort and work with various organizations. And then we moved to the state of Indianapolis where I was with my husband and had a new life. And eventually I didn't know if I could vote. And so I was just like, well, let me just go see what happens. And I filled out the form at DMV, and next thing you know, I got my voter registration card. I felt like a whole person in that, that local right. election where I went and participated. But then we moved back to Virginia. My husband's job moved into Virginia, and here we were again at another election, presidential election, and I was in the same position. And so I had been working with, like I mentioned, some of the people that helped to bring me home. Ben Jealous, who was president of the national NAACP, he was one of the first people that brought my case to President Clinton's attention when he was a Rhodes Scholar. And so coming being president, he knew about me not being able to vote. So he had me be a part of an NAACP delegation that traveled to Geneva, Switzerland three times to talk about voter suppression laws in the, United in the United States at the United Nations. Surreal for me to be a part of history, having a voice where I'm listening to high officials from different nations shaking their heads like, is this going on in America? <laughs> where in Africa, in, in uh, South Africa, they allow people incarcerated to vote. And so eventually I did get my rights restored um, by the governor, but again, it's so dehumanizing. Right. Voting is a funda basic fundamental human right. Once a person has come out, done their time, why would you prohibit them from being a part of the political process? Obviously, if they want to be a part of the political process, they're going down the road you want them to go down. And I can remember going to, when I couldn't vote, going to the polls with my little son, and he's asking me, Mommy, why can't you vote? Because one of his friend's dads was running for a lieutenant governor, and I had to explain that to him. How does that make a child feel when he knows that his parent can't vote like anybody else? No one thinks of these ripple collateral effects. And so I'm very grateful to have been involved in it. Even though my rights were restored, there's still over 4 million people across this country. And from my understanding with having a conversation from someone from the ACLU, Minnesota is one of the states that permanently banned someone. So y'all need to work on that quick. Because it's not right. And so I'm going to sit
sit down because I know we're going to have a panel discussion as well, but it did take a, a huge effort for me to be where I am, and the power of the no. pen definitely helped. Yes. This magazine, I thank God for journalists, reporters, Reginald Stewart, um, George Curry, who was the publisher, had it not been for this, and Black America and White America being outraged at what was going on for them to get involved. And I thank God for him giving me a voice so that I could continue to speak out with these issues. But a quote from Martin Luther King, he says, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it expedient? And then expedience comes along and asks the question, is it politics? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? Conscience asks the question, is it right? There comes a time when one must take the position that is neither safe nor politic, nor popular, right. but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. That's and right. so there is a transformation. And we know right from wrong. And Nakima, thank you for taking the bold stance that you're taking because some of these issues that you're talking about, it's taken a while for the NAACP to get to this point. And so... But you keep moving and keep your eyes on the prize. And I thank you so much for having me.